I'm going to talk now about um, if you went into somebody's home and tried to determine how effective their hood might be, um, what are the sort of things that you can do? And basically, there are um, three, three approaches that we can take. And they, they include uh, measuring the airflow, and we've already heard a lot of talk about airflow. Um, something that we call capture efficiency, and I'll explain that a little bit later, but mostly it's about uh, how, how much of the contaminants that are generated during, during cooking are exhausted by an exhaust hood. Um, so I will not be talking about the recirculation hoods like, like Martin did for the last few minutes. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about how do we know about how often hoods are used when people are cooking. So if you want to measure airflow measurement in somebody's kitchen, and by the way, this is my kitchen, and my colleague Woody helped doing the measurements here, um, it's a bit tricky because um, different hoods have got different air inlets on the bottom, and you can see here we have a cardboard box that we cut up to make into some sort of capture device, and basically you need to do that for every hood. We're going to use a fan flow meter to measure the flow, and the reason why there's a fan in, in that flow meter is because adding all this ducting in the cardboard box restricts the flow. So we measure the pressure between the cardboard box and the room and zero it out with the fan so that we get back to the flow we would have got if we hadn't used this uh, device to try and measure the airflow. So basically, we're, we're getting rid of the, the pressure drop included by the measurement system in order to do that. And the trickiest part of this is, is building that cardboard uh, transition piece to actually connect underneath the hood. It's even harder with, with microwave hoods. At least in the US, these are becoming quite popular, where there's a microwave that has a fan that also has the extractor fan in it. And the, the tricky part with these is they're often used as recirculation devices where the air goes in the bottom and out of the top, where it's returned to the room. Um, but we are talking here about using them in venting mode, where they do exhaust to outside. In which case, those vents that used to return to the room suck air out of the room, and it becomes quite difficult to measure both the inflow into the bottom of the hood and into the top at the same time. So to try and compensate for this to make our field testing easier, uh, we did laboratory tests where we put a fan flow meter on the inlet and the outlet at the same time. And uh, we did a lot of experiments on several hoods, and we found out about 15% of the flow is going into these uh, vents across along the top here. So if you wanted to do sort of a simple correction, you could measure the flow in the bottom and add 15% to it. It varied a little bit from hood to hood, but not very much. So if we go into some homes, I'm going to actually do some measurements. So these were some older homes. These were measured several years ago. So we have six different homes. Um, we recorded what type of hood it was, whether it was a, a microwave hood like I just mentioned or not. We measured the flow at different speeds. Most of these devices have got uh, two or three flow settings here. We have low, medium, and high. And we also recorded what fraction or what percentage of this flow uh, is it compared to what the rating is. Um, at least in the US, most hoods are rated for flow under uh, very specific laboratory conditions. But we generally find, as those percentages show, that we measure much lower in real kitchens than we do in the laboratory tests. That's mostly because the laboratory tests have done a very, very low airflow resistance and don't account for the ducting that connects connected to the outlet. We also looked here to compare it to what the minimum flow requirements are. And here in the US, we have a standard that's ASHRAE 622 that specifies a minimum airflow of 50 liters per second. And you can see um, on high, um, we get the, the first three homes were pretty good, the last three not so good, and, um, on the, and the same on low. So the test speed didn't matter, but something that I, I'm not going to get into on this talk is that we also require that that 50 liters a second is produced at a low sound level, and you would have to meet that 50 liters a second on the lowest setting for these particular devices. So you can see about half the time we are meeting uh, that specification for a minimum airflow. Um, we've also recently done some studies in, in new homes, and uh, I'm going to talk about three different studies here. Well, the, the first one that I have the table for is uh, 72 homes that were built since 2008 in California. The 2008 matters because that's when we significantly changed our ventilation standards in California. And um, the theory is that things uh, improved when we did that. And Indeed, we find that on average, uh, sorry, I'm using the medians here. If I look at the median flow rather than the average flow, um, we do get higher flows than in those older homes. 
There is a huge range, though, from something like uh, 15 to almost 400 liters a second. Um, the figures in brackets there are showing the fifth and the 95th percentiles of what we measured out of those 72 homes. So a massive range in installed airflow performance. And we found out that generally the microwave devices have much lower total flow. Um, a couple of other studies, we uh, looked at four homes built that were even newer built in 2012. They averaged about uh, 72 liters a second. They all met this 50 liter a second uh, minimum requirement um, that we have in the US. And also uh, we've most, most recently, rather than single family homes, looked at some apartments. And these did not have um, such good flow. They were down at 43 liters a second on average for low speed, 70 on high. And about a third of them met that minimum 50 liters per second requirement on low speed, which is what they would operate on when they were being quiet, which is the requirement and the standard. But if you can put up with the noise, almost 80% were okay. So this is um, not the end of the world, but uh, not awesome results by any means. There's, there's clearly changes in performance from the laboratory tests to what you find in installations. And primarily this is due to the airflow resistance of installed systems being much higher than the airflow resistance being used in the laboratory testing. So another thing we try and measure in homes is the capture efficiency. And basically the, the idea about capture efficiency is this is the fraction of the cooking contaminants that are directly exhausted by the cooker hood. I have a little illustration here that shows for this microwave example, you know, 40% of the airflow goes into the microwave is exhausted outside by the fan, and 60% goes into the kitchen and the rest of the house for, their, for the occupants to breathe. So ideally, uh, we'd like 100% capture. That's probably gonna be difficult though, but we're looking for higher capture efficiency numbers uh, or as high as we can get. So how do we do this uh, in the field? Um, so if you've got a gas cooktop, you can turn on the burner and use a gas meter to determine the use, how much uh, gas you're using, the use rate, and you can do some simple stoichiometric calculations to determine what the carbon dioxide emission rate is. And we're gonna use that carbon dioxide effectively as our tracer gas here. So the CO2 is emitted by the cooktop. And if we measure the CO2 uh, in the room and in the exhaust duct, so we put a little bit of tubing up into the exhaust duct of the range hood, and we also measure the airflow uh, using the method I described earlier, we can use this equation here to figure out what is our capture efficiency. And um, if, we, if we look at some of the monitored CO2 data, here's a quick example of it. Um, I, 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 this is two measurements. The, the first data here is for measurements on the back burners and the, and the lower ones for the front burners. What you can see here is that background rate uh, is the blue line near the bottom and we're just under about 500 ppm in this kitchen. And when we turn on the burners, uh, the, the CO2 uh, in the exhaust jumps up to nearly 1,900 for the back burners and about 1,400 for the front burners. You can see we have slightly different emission rates here too. That's the E number there. The front burners are bigger capacity, so they have more emission in terms of CO2 than the back burners. And you can see also that the calculated capture efficiency that's based on the difference between these two carbon dioxide measurements is much higher on the back burners. It is near 100%, but only about half of the emissions from the front burners are captured. And Martin just mentioned in his talk about the variability and, and capture with time. And you can see this by the fluctuations in those CO2 measurements, particularly for the front burners where the plume of uh, hot air that's got the carbon dioxide in it from operating the burner is sometimes going into the hood and sometimes not. You see that fluctuation. So it is important in these measurements to average over about five minutes to get a good measurement of the CO2 concentration. You can't take a single point measurement because of this fluctuation in the capture efficiency, particularly for front burners. So if we take this test method and actually use it in some homes, um, we went to 15 homes, we had all sorts of different uh, kit ventilation devices, some downdraft devices, microwaves. We looked at the shape of the hoods too, whether they had a flat bottom or whether or not they had a, a sump or a deep opening and some sort of in between. Um, we looked at doing front burners, back burners, one of each. Uh, we put pots of water on also. And also we did oven tests where we operated the oven at uh, 245 degrees C with the door closed. And, allowed, and between each test, we allowed the system to cool down. And so what do we get uh, when we do these measurements in homes? The answer is the data are all over the place. So basically 
the, um, the house is each sort of vertical set of data here. At the top, you can see the different fan flows that we measured. And the capture efficiency is at the bottom here. And we split out the back burners and the front burners. And I know there's a lot of jumbled up data here, but you can definitely see the back burners have higher capture efficiency. In particular, if you look at house D1 here, you can see the back burner capture efficiency is excellent, excellent but terrible on the front. And that's using a downdraft device where it pops up at the back of the of the range uh, or the cooktop, sorry, and it exhausts from there. And it's it's fine at capturing the com contaminants from the burner when it's right next to the air inlet, but terrible when it's far away. Um, for for honesty's sake, I have to tell you that this is my uh, my uh, kitchen, and you can see that um, I don't have any very low numbers like a lot of these places. But um, I did I never got to 100% with any of uh, with any of my results. And you can see silly that, like the cooktop, the, the oven capture efficiency is all over the place. We do have some devices that are consistently very good, however. And the reason why we split them into these types is that we uh, realize that some shapes are better than others. So, some, so this, what we call open here, which is if you've got sort of a deep bowl that is better at capturing that plume, tends to lead to better capture efficiency. Not always, but that's the trend. But the important thing is that the, the range of performance is basically uh, between zero capture efficiency and 100%. So clearly, uh, there's, there's a big range in performance here, and we definitely need to measure these things. The, um, the next thing I want to talk about is a, uh, 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 the data from uh, a more recent study looking at some apartments. Again, we're looking at uh, gas burners. Um, with water and new renovated dwellings. And so the important thing, these are brand new installations. These have not had a time to plug up with grease or anything or, or, or become broken. These are all low income. Um, we also looked at uh, whether or not people were, said they were cooking much, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. And in six of the units, we measured capture efficiency, again, using the same technique. And um, so these are showing the, the different shadings there are the six different apartments. Uh, we tested on low speed and high speed front from burner back burner. And again, you can see a capture efficiency range from the low of about 50% all the way up to about 100%. Um, operating at high speed is obviously better, but it's noisy. And uh, again, we see the same trend where we do much better at capturing on the back burners than the front burners. So um, we've also done laboratory tests, and, and we see this same thing. There's definitely a trend with um, the amount of airflow, as you would expect, and this trend of having back burner capture efficiency is much better than front burner. And this is just a function of geometry. The hoods just cover the back burner so much better than the front burners. When you're using the front burner, some of the plume can escape, and that's what we see with these low capture efficiency measurements. The next measurement technique is what I call the foil curtain. Um, the idea here is that you use foil to create an artificial total capture hood which we assume has 100% capture. That's what's shown on the left. And so you do some tests with the, with the foil burn, with the foil hood, and then you lift it up to continue the test. We, we preliminary developed this so we could, could look at the contaminants from electric cooking where there is no source of CO2. We have to artificially introduce CO2, and, we couldn't, and there wasn't a simple way to do it, there, to do it as we showed earlier. So effectively what you do with this test is you measure the background CO2 with no burners operating and no CO2 injection operating. You then do it again, where if you've, you either use the gas burner or you have to inject a uh, trace of gas. So you need to provide a source of trace of gas and inject it into the pot above the burner. And we measure the CO2 concentration in the exhaust duct with that oil shroud in place, that C100 number. We remove the shroud and repeat the test. And we look at the changing concentration between the exhaust duct in the room and the ratio of what you measure with um, the foil out of the way and with the foil in place gives you an estimate of capture efficiency. And if we look at some results using uh, this test, this is in uh, six, six apartments here. Um, the note there is the drawback with some of this field testing is that it's not always easy to put the tubing in to measure the CO2 and the exhaust duct. In the first house, there's no way to do it without actually damaging the hood, so we did not do it. But again, you can see here that um, we see the big difference between front and back burners, and again, the difference between low speed and high speed. And again, highly variable results, uh, depending on the particular hood that was used. 
and this is also uh, something that Martin uh, mentioned, is that it really does depend a lot on things like the kitchen geometry, where the air enters the kitchen, you know, particularly where the doorway is, if you have an open window. Um, these can change these results quite dramatically, even with the same hood in the same kitchen. But as you see here, a lot of variability. And the last topic I want to talk about in terms of actually measuring stuff in people's homes is finding out when do people cook and how much, and when they cook, do they actually operate their hoods? Because if the hood is not turned on, obviously it's not very effective. So the two techniques we used were pretty simple. Uh, one was to use these little, the things, they're called eye buttons, but there are other products available, which are very small um, temperature sensors that you can stick with uh, metallic tape to a cooktop. You put them near the burners, and that gives you an estimate of whether the burner is on or not. In terms of knowing whether or not the uh, cooker hood is operating, um, it's also important to know what speed it's operating at. As I think all the results we've looked at today have shown, high speed's better than low speed, so you need to know what speed you're operating at. So it's not a simple yes, no answer. You need some idea of the flow. So we use these uh, little vein anemometers that uh, will record data for a few weeks. And with these, you can know what, roughly what speed the uh, device is operating at by looking at the output from the anemometer. A tricky part of this is figuring out if, I'm do, if I've got those temperature measurements, how do I know if something is on or off? Because the temperatures don't change very suddenly. And basically, uh, we developed algorithms to process these temperature data uh, by looking at the rate of change of, of temperature. And these plots here, just a couple of illustrations of that. You can see the, the red line there in the top plot is the sensor nearest the burner being used. The two lower lines are showing you what happens on nearby um, uh, sensors. And you can see the whole cooktop does heat up. But we would focus on the, that red trace and look at the rate of change of temperature to determine when the burner was turned on and off. It gets even more complicated in the bottom chart, looking at multiple burners, trying to disaggregate how many burners are on at one time. Um, and this requires an actual human being to intervene to figure out what temperature rise is important, what temperature drop is important. So we actually calibrated these sensors using people looking at data. We could not find some machine learning algorithms to learn this, but we're working on that. Um, oven use um, is uh, kind of interesting. You have to figure out where the air is leaving the oven. All ovens have some sort of vent and put the, uh, put the sensor near the oven vent. And we, again, were able to look at the rate of change of temperature and figure out when, when ovens were on. You could just take a stick of sensor on the cooktop because the bottom plot here shows the cooktop response to a burner operating, the whole thing, all device heats up, but it's not as good as actually measuring the airflow out of the vent. And what sort of numbers are we looking at here? So if you want to try this at your own home or do your own experiments, the sort of temperature rise range is something like for cooktops, 0.6 to 1 degree C per minute. Uh, for ovens, um, there's a bigger range. Look at the start of the event. And then looking at the end of the event, those numbers are slightly different, about 0.2 to 0.5 degrees C per minute. Again, it's very difficult to automate this process uh, in our experience. We had to sort of, we would take uh, some example tests and then do some visual inspection of them to find out what temperature rise and drop were going to work well. But once we'd done that one time, we could use it to say the whole several weeks that these homes were monitored. And we found out that um, because we were also logging other things to know when actual cooker use uh, uh, was happening because we monitored the gas use for these devices, we found that these ways of just looking at temperatures are right up between about 80 and 90 percent most of the time. So um, if, we, if we look at the uh, analyzing these temperature data, find out you know when do people actually use their cooker hood, we found out that people use their cooker hoods about 30 percent of the time when they were when they were actually using the cooktop, about 20 percent of the time with oven use. So maybe not as much as we would want. Um, if people cooked longer and had more burners operating, there was more cooker hood use. And the people are not very good predictors of their cooking behavior. We used a survey to ask people what they were doing. And when people said that they didn't really use their cooker hood, we found they actually used it about 12% of the time. And when people said, oh yes, I always turn on my cooker hood, they only used it about 30 to 40% of the time. So this tells us we can't rely on surveys to get people to tell us about cooker hood use. We probably actually do need to measure it. 
So to summarize, um, looking at these three different measurement methods and ways of evaluating effectiveness, um, the airflow measurement uh, can be done, but it does need some sort of temporary flow capture fabrication. Um, for microwave hoods, um, trying to capture all the vents is tricky, or you can add about 15% if you're just measuring the airflow in the bottom. And old homes installations were generally much poorer than new ones, but we all, almost always find hoods that are not meeting the airflow specification from standardized testing, because the standardized testing, currently at least in the US, does not include the airflow resistance of the ducting these devices get connected to. For capture efficiency, there's a couple of different approaches. For if you've got gas, you can and can measure the gas consumption rate of the burner and measure CO2. You can determine an estimate of capture efficiency. Um, for electric cooking, um, you can use the foil shroud, uh, and but you're going to have to bring your own CO2 source for that to work. Um, there's a huge range in installed performance, basically from zero to 100% capture, and we always do better on back burners and at higher airflows. And lastly, in terms of using small temperature sensors to determine actual cooking events and figure out if cooker hood use corresponds to cooking very much, um, we, can, we have developed a method where you can look at the rate of temperature increase and decrease for each um, device. It does take some visual inspection to figure out what the trigger points are, but once you've determined those, you can sort of reliably use them. Let's say you're monitoring for several weeks or months. They do become pretty reliable measures of whether or not cooking is happening. And uh, so they're not perfect, but they're probably okay for possessing use patterns. And I want to finish by acknowledging the fact that um, um, my colleagues here in this long list are the people who actually went in the field and did these measurements and developed these techniques with me. Um, and they, they are responsible for the pictures that you saw here and all this wonderful data. And we couldn't do any of this without our sponsors, which is the U.S. Department of Energy Building America program and a lot of good support from uh, the state of California. Uh, all this testing was done in California because California, at least in the US, is sort of at the forefront of doing things like ventilating homes and sponsoring this sort of research. So I'll end there.